Uh, we're so glad you're here. I would like to begin by acknowledging that the land we're gathered on is the uh, unceded traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, including the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people. Um, thank you for coming to help us launch Charged Up. We're so thrilled that you're here. I'm Sherry Yano. I'm with the David Suzuki Foundation. I'm the team lead for Charged Up, and I've been working with my wonderful colleagues for a few months, and some of them for much longer on this project. And we're so uh, happy to be launching it with you guys tonight. Uh, Charged Up is about the transition to renewable energy, so accelerating that transition. Renewable energy is really about the opportunity to put the power of energy generation in communities across the country. Um, it's about uh, energy diversification and um, new jobs and climate protection. Uh, we know that Indigenous communities are leading on this transition. And um, there are over a thousand uh, projects in Indigenous uh, renewable energy projects in, renew in um, Indigenous communities across the country. Uh, projects that use the sun, the wind, water, uh, waste, and um, the earth to uh, meet energy needs. Um, we know that we would do well to follow the lead of these communities on, and their work on renewable energy as well as energy efficiency, often with a goal of increasing energy self-sufficiency. Um, I would like to introduce uh, Deborah Sparrow from the Musqueam Nation, who has offered, us, uh, offered to welcome us onto the traditional territory. Deborah is an educator and an acclaimed weaver. She's been weaving for 20 years, I think it's 30, it sounds like, 30 years, and is deeply involved with the revival of this Musqueam art. Um, her blankets are on display at museums across the country, as well as at the Vancouver Airport and UBC. And you have an exhibit on right now at the Museum of Anthropology until April 15th. So, yeah, sounds like a wonderful thing. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you for that. I'm glad the lighting's good in here today. On behalf of my chief, Wayne Sparrow, my council, but really on behalf of my ancestors for which we're standing here today, I'd like to welcome each and every one of you to this beautiful land we call Vancouver. Uh, on behalf of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh, our relatives, our friends. You know, I think that's a beautiful title to say that we're charged up. I hope you're all charged up in this room tonight. I know I am because I listened to the program this morning on Roundhouse and when Stephen was talking. But I ran in to get a coffee and by the time I got back he wasn't talking about the Kinder Morgan anymore so I missed that. I'll have to go listen to the replay. Because that's such a huge concern for all of us and how that's going to play out if it does. And so we have a lot of work to do and all of you wonderful, beautiful beings in this room today are on the same path. I know that's why you're here. And I always want to hold my hands up to David because I remember always watching him on TV all these years and knowing what was in his heart and now being able to share that with him and all of you in the journey that's going to save our planet. David, we can't even thank you enough from the depths of our souls to the connection of our ancestors who I know walk with you as well your father, your ancestors, all of us who know that we're at a, such a crucial place in this world today, but that we have our youth who are understanding this as well. And it's our responsibility to take them by the hand and teach them and walk with them through the forest to remind them that there is even one. Because I always say when I come down to city of Vancouver, this is the concrete forest now. How do, how does everyone live down here and feel like they're still part of the natural world? And how far can we go in places like Richmond when I drove there this morning and it's becoming a sea and a wall of concrete as well. And it's a place where we grew up as kids and played where all all of the um, land was being tilled for food. 
and now it's becoming shorter and shorter and where are we going to grow our food and who's going to look after that and so what decisions we have to think about and make and how complex it is and yet I know again that I have great faith and hope because of the work I do in just keeping in touch with my ancestors that we will come up with all of the solutions we need to make this world the place that we want to be in and to continue to do it. So again, on behalf of my ancestors, um, I wish you a good gathering tonight and good words. And I'll leave you with, uh, with a really beautiful little story I once read, and I thought it was very powerful. And I may have, may have shared this with you before because I come quite often now into the city on behalf of my chief and my council and my people to do this. It was about a man who was feeling sometimes defeated and wasn't really sure how far he wanted to go without giving up. So he made his journey up to the top of the mountain and he, he knelt down and he looked out over the mountain and maybe to the city and said, he looked up and he said, Oh, Creator, you must be so disappointed with us. What can we do? He said, You need to send somebody, send somebody to help us. And it was as if a voice came in the wind and it said, I did send somebody. I sent you. And you and you and all of you in this room, following the lead of this lovely man here, to do what we need to do. So Haichika to all of you, and I hope to see you again. Haichika, thank you. Thanks so much, Deborah. Um, and thanks to all of you for coming. Some quick housekeeping. If you don't mind setting your cell phones to uh, silent, that would be much appreciated. And if you're looking for the washroom, just up the uh, doors or up the stairs to the back, and people will be able to show you uh, where you need to go. Um, I see many of you here tonight who have uh, given us advice on, to inform this project, Charged Up. And I see a lot of you here tonight, too, who inspire us uh, with the work that you do. Um, let me give you some quick background on Charged Up. When we undertook some polling, we found that 70% of Canadians favour a transition to renewable energy. Um, renewable energy is the most exciting climate solution in terms of community support, and it is support that carries across political lines, which is, which is really important. Um, when we polled the David Suzuki Foundation's community, so I think 9,000 people com completed a long survey, we found that 98% of our community supports renewable energy. That may not be surprising. Um, but what is surprising, or what was surprising to us, was when we asked them to name a single renewable energy project, 90% of them could not name it. And, th and there are thousands of projects um, in communities across this country. So uh, what that meant to us was that renewable energy is still distant and irrelevant largely to people's daily lives. The good news is that people want to learn more, that's what they told us, and they are really the seed for this project. Um, because of the work that David and Tara, Sarika, Severin, the board, and all of my colleagues at the foundation do, um, we reach a large number of Canadians, almost uh, like up to a million a week in English and French primarily, and to a lesser extent in uh, Mandarin and Cantonese. Um, and um, we've spoken to many of you as well. I think over 150 so far in academia, in the renewable energy sector, in other industries, environmental groups, community leaders, government at all levels, uh, labor groups, financial institutions, philanthropic organizations, and grassroots groups. And you have given us a lot of great advice. Uh, many of you told us that are, there are a lot of groups doing uh, research, policy advocacy, and direct government relations. Super important stuff, especially now. And you also told us that there are groups doing, um, you know, holding the line on fossil fuels, on pipelines, on tankers, on new projects, also very essential. But you also said that not enough people 
are um, working with the public to try to move the public to support the transition to renewable energy. And that's where Charged Up comes in. We want to work with all of you, uh, first of all, to tell the stories of inspiring communities who are doing uh, amazing work on renewable energy. And um, just to demonstrate to Canadians that this is something that is already happening at the grassroots level in communities across the country. Um, we also want to help get more communities um, um, up and running as active producers of renewable energy rather than just ratepayers and consumers. We want to help all of us become more engaged in shaping our energy system. So that's renewable energy production, but it's also energy efficiency. Um, we want to create a network uh, of renewable energy champions who really want to see more of it on the ground in their communities and who also want to be vocal at the structural level to call for the changes that we need in you know, the technical and policy solutions, the regulation, the programs that we need to really make this change at the systems level. Uh, we know that we can't do this alone, and this is really about collective momentum, collective learning, collective action. So we're so delighted uh, that you're here with us tonight to launch this project. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce our new CEO, uh, Steve Cornish, who came to the David Suzuki Foundation last fall, I think late last fall. Um, Steve comes to us after serving five years as Executive Director of Metzel Sans Frontières Canada. He managed major humanitarian interventions including programs in Chechnya, Sierra Leone, Georgia and Peru. Yikes, wow. Um, he holds a Master's Degree in Global Risk and Crisis Management from the Sorbonne in Paris and has managed, um, served in management and advisory capacity to the Canadian Red Cross and Care Canada. Welcome Steve. Well, thanks so much, Sherry, for that uh, lovely introduction, and good evening to all of you, and thank you so much for all coming this evening to celebrate with us the launch of Charged Up. And I don't mean the relaunch of Drake's video. That's not the Charged Up we're talking about. We knew that joke wouldn't work, but we had to have a joke, and we couldn't find a joke, so that's the joke we chose. <laughs> but it's actually David Suzuki Foundation's new renewable energy initiative, not, not the remake of, of the video. So as Sherry pointed out, I recently joined the foundation after about 20 years, uh, most of it overseas in humanitarian and development aid. And there in, in many different instances, I witnessed firsthand uh, the suffering that's coming to many communities. And that suffering over the last decade, we've seen increasingly rising as a result of climate change. Uh, we've seen increasing uh, natural disasters, multi-year droughts, epidemics and disease patterns that are coming into new areas climate refugees, and all of these affecting the most poorest and the countries that, that can least afford to be able to manage these issues. And so I joined the foundation here because although we have to bring aid uh, to those who need it most in crisis, um, something inside me was saying that, that you can't just keep coming in emergency as the ambulance to try to put out this fire if you know you're not doing anything about the long-term effects. And when we look at the science, we know what's coming. It's clear that we're coming into an age of much greater destruction and despair than, than what I've already seen around the world. And so I wanted to put my energies behind uh, all of you who are already working uh, in this field, trying to mitigate and to prevent uh, the scale and the scope of the suffering to come. And I think it's a very worthwhile endeavor, and I'm very humbled to be able to join you in, in this endeavor that many of you have been leading on for so long already. It's no secret and no surprise to, to the folks in this room that the impacts of climate change uh, on bio biodiversity, uh, toxic pollution, some of these are among the most serious issues that are facing our planet today. And the decisions that we make today to address these challenges, they're going to affect us. Uh, and they're going to make the difference uh, of whether or not we survive and thrive now and into the foreseeable future. In the short time that I've been at the foundation, I've had the opportunity to, to visit our projects and, and our supporters across the country. And I've seen butterfly way corridors in Toronto that are <coughs> trying to reverse the loss of monarchs and, and, and butterflies caused by over-reliance of pesticides that we still use despite the fact that we know that they're creating resistance and they're actually not that, that effective. 
uh, I've learned about sustainable city initiatives and uh, urban transportation in Montreal from our Quebec team. And here I follow the journey of the Salish Sea Orcas, the 76 that are remaining that you have been living with and, and, and seeing the beauty of right here in BC for so long. In that short time, DSF has published reports on the state of drinking water advisories in First Nations. And we've been across the country defending the right to a healthy environment all across the country with Canadians and, and all the way to Parliament. And all of this is made possible by the one million Canadians who back the foundation. And it's their backing and the abilities that they have to get activated and to take action uh, that are what allows us to run these grassroots programs and in the end to secure a groundbreaking impact at a national scale. Looking around the room tonight, I see many of you uh, who are our most engaged supporters, partners from industry, from government, from foundations, from other organizations, and all of you are going to be the instruments of making a better future, and in many cases, you already are. By working together and piloting new ideas, we are able to get more walks of life involved in the solutions, and we need to continue in this direction if we're going to make the type of change that we really need to see. And I know in my heart of hearts, that that kind of change is possible. Sometimes when we set out these big goals that we need to reach, or when we see the, the scale of the devastation, we might not understand what role we can play. It might become too complex, so we kind of turn off and turn away. We get on with our daily lives. Uh, but I know that change is possible because I've seen it firsthand in different areas. And I was very fortunate on one of my first missions overseas to go to Nepal in the high Himalayas. And there, I saw the Sherpa people who were living in concert with nature. Prior to a tourist boom, which occurred in the late 80s and the early 90s. And with the influx of tourists, they began overtaxing their sacred environment. And soon, they couldn't keep up. Eventually, they began causing deforestation, polluting the waterways, all in an effort to try to serve these so-called eco-tourists who were coming to see one of the most pristine areas in the world. At first, colorful pyramids of plastics were outside little tea houses. And that was a signal that it was a great place to eat, and this was the place to be, until those pyramids became too high. And then they started to dump those pyramids of plastic and garbage in the wayside and then into the rivers. And unbeknownst to them, that pollution went downstream and started to cause epidemics in communities below. We came in with a small organization and our first job and our intent was to clean up along the trails and all of the damage done by the ecotourists. But we soon realized that much more than that had to, had to happen if we were going to make an impact. And so when we looked around, what could we do about all of this debris and garbage, we realized that the communities wouldn't burn the garbage because only prayer flags and, uh, and um, prayers to the gods could be burned. And they weren't digging to, to bury the garbage because at altitude it's very hard to do and it's very rocky and difficult soil. But nonetheless, we started to work with the communities and instituted a whole garbage and waste collection system. And then we brought solar panels. And the solar panels were largely to stop the reliance on the hot water that they had to cut trees to boil to make tea, to make showers, to clean the clothes of all of these eco-tourists that, that had come in. And once we had those systems in place, the neighboring communities, they saw the positive impact that this was making. And they were inspired to seek solar installations and waste management systems in their communities as well. And we saw positive side effects that were not even intended. As school children could now do their homework at night, families spent more time together, and the communities started to help each other on the same journey to follow the few steps that we were able to take with them. This program that we are launching, Charged Up, is designed to do the very same thing and to bring that type of outcome to communities and to cities and towns right here at home. These stories of transformation make our clean energy future visible, one project at a time. And in turn, they help empower, they help educate, community leaders, citizens, giving them inspiration, giving them mentoring, and giving them the know-how to take their own steps to become 
and to start their own energy transitions themselves. And this project, as was already pointed out by Sherry, exists only because of donors and partners like yourself. Many of you have been in pivotal and instrumental in bringing us advice and ideas. Many more have put their funding behind us, and you haven't just cut checks and walked away. You've given us ideas, expertise, and partnership, and a partnership that will continue if we're going to be able to make success of this. Because the only way we'll be able to do it is if you're continually feeding back, continually helping us all together, bringing us new stories, new communities, new partners, learning along the way, so that when we trip and fall, you'll be there to pick us up. And when we're having difficulty seeing the way, together we'll find the way to be able to ensure that communities all across this country will be able to take heart, take heed, and take action so that we can have a greener future for all. I want to thank Van City and Energy Geeks, they're our most general sponsors for this evening's events. Van City finances green buildings because across the organization they recognize the impact of the built environment on climate energy. And Energy Geeks believe that it's important for all of us to do our part and to make the world a better place through clean energy. What we're trying to do with this program is not only to show communities how they can take action themselves, but to gather 80,000 Canadians in over 100 cities and communities projects across the country. And we're going to turn them into a network to push for municipal, provincial and federal change that will make sure that this transition to a greener future and to a renewable energy future can never be rolled back no matter what happens at the polls. So now, without further ado, I'd like to invite the man who inspired so many of us in this room to care about the environment and to pursue a future of clean energy in community, Dr. David Suzuki. Thank you, Stephen. Well, thank you all for coming this evening. It's uh, marvelous to see you and feel energized just by the number and the diversity of uh, folks that we have here. A lot of you have been supporters for a long time or who are joining us along the way, and I feel that this kind of an audience is an affirmation that uh, we're in the, the middle of a, a, a big change. Thank you very much. I, um, ever since Stephen Harper was elected, I've always had to preface my remarks by saying I don't belong I'm no longer sitting on the board of the David Suzuki Foundation, and I'm not speaking on behalf of the DSF, although I really am. But, uh, I have to say that so that we, the foundation doesn't get nailed for my uh, intemperate remarks that I'm going to make. As a, as a biologist, it's uh, very intriguing to look back at what scientists now uh, infer was the origins of our species, and it's very clear that humans probably originated in Africa 150,000 years ago. And when you try to imagine uh, what the world was like when our species appeared on the planet, it was probably the great plains of Africa were filled with animals in diversity and abundance far beyond anything you'd ever see on the Serengeti today. And uh, those little clusters of three, four, or five of these funny-looking two-legged furless apes that was us. And we weren't that impressive. I mean, there weren't many of us. We weren't very big or strong or fast or endowed with special sensory ability. But we had one thing going for us, which was a two kilogram organ buried deep in our skulls. And one of the things that brain did that I consider remarkable, it invented an idea called the future. The future doesn't exist. The only thing that exists is now and what we remember from the past. But because the human brain created this concept of a future, we're the only animal that realized we can affect the future by what we do today. Based on our knowledge and experience, we can look ahead. We can see where the dangers lie and the opportunities are and deliberately choose today to avoid the dangers and exploit the opportunities. I believe foresight was a huge advantage that our species had over all the other creatures on the planet. With that foresight, even armed with crude tools like spears and stone axes and, and digging sticks, we were a very effective predator and we spread across the planet. We, um, 
we, if we come to today, when we are now the dominant animal on the planet, we are so powerful today in numbers, technology, consumption, uh, econ economies, that scientists say we are the major factor shaping the biological, physical, and chemical properties of the planet on a geological scale. That's why scientists have now defined this brief period, sudden period, maybe starting in the 1940s to now, as the Anthropocene, the age of human beings, when we are the dominant factor shaping the planet. But we don't know enough to be able to apply our enormous powers now in a way that is truly sustainable. And, but we are armed now with scientists, scientists who have the addi uh, additional power of supercomputers. And so for over 40 years, scientists have been looking ahead and warning us of the dangers that lie ahead, telling us where the opportunities lie. But for some reason, we are now turning our backs on the very survival strategy that got us to where we are today. And this, is, I think, is the real challenge. Why is it that today, when we have so much uh, better capacity to use our foresight, are we turning our backs on that, uh, that powerful survival strategy? So as an elder now, I can look back and trace some of the surprising events that may indicate what the problems uh, are with confronting uh, that future. And I want to go back to 1973-74. Some of you, I see Rudy is here, you remember the Arab oil embargo, OPEC oil embargo, when the uh, uh, oil producing uh, countries decided to turn down the spigots. And that was a very frightening time. You know, we had to line up to get gas, gas prices spiked. And of course, in the United States, people were lined up and they started shooting each other. Um, and it, it, was, it was a time when we had to say, what the heck is going on with our, our energy uh, programs here? And so the government appointed one of our most prominent scientists, Ursula Franklin, to head a commission to look at what do we do in terms of confronting this, uh, this oil crisis. And in 1978, she completed her study, which was titled Canada, as a conserver society. And she pointed out that what we have to do is to be much more efficient in the way we use our raw materials, that in terms of energy, we must get into renewable energy and we had an opportunity to become global leaders then in this new area of uh, opportunity. And what happened to that report? The, re we, the government thanked Dr. Franklin, thank you very much for doing this, put it on the shelf, and of course, promptly forgot it. So I went to, uh, of course, by then we knew about uh, climate change, global warming. In 1988, I went to Australia for the first time. The Australians had set up a new organization called the Commission for the Future, and it employed scientists to look ahead, to use their foresight in looking at the future of Australia. And for the first time, I met climatologists who showed me their data, and I went, holy cow. I, you see, I'd done a show on global warming for the nature of things in which I called it a slow motion catastrophe. And we really thought back in the uh, 80s that uh, global warming was going to kick in maybe 50, 60, 70 years away. I was more focused on forestry issues and mining issues and uh, fisheries issues and pollution uh, problems and because I thought we had lots of time to deal with global warming. 1988 for me in Australia was the recognition that we had to act uh, immediately. 1988, there was a, a very hot summer in the United States and James Hansen, one of the eminent climatologists, went to Congress and testified and said, this summer is an indication of global warming. And it caused a tremendous response in the media. People began to take this very, very seriously. In 1988, a guy ran for president of the United States 
and said, if you vote for me, I promise I will be an environmental president. Do you know who that was, Sadhu? Yeah, I know, you'll be shocked. George H.W. Bush. He didn't have a green bone in his body, but he said it because Americans had put the environment at the top of the agenda. In 1988, we re-elected Brian Mulroney as Prime Minister. And to show that Brian cared about the environment, he appointed his brightest star to be the Minister of the Environment, moved the Ministry of the Environment into the Inner Cabinet, and made it a prestigious uh, position. So uh, I was going to quiz people on who that was, but anyway, the, uh, that was uh, Lucien Bouchard. And I interviewed Lucien Bouchard three months after he was appointed, and I said, Mr. Bouchard, what have you found is the most important issues that Canadians face today? And he immediately answered, global warming. Well, that was impressive. So I said, how serious is it? And his exact words were, it threatens the survival of our species. We have to act now. In 1988, in the fall, uh, Stephen Lewis told me that he was appointed to chair sessions in a meeting of 300 climatologists from around the world at the uh, University of Toronto. And the climatologists were so concerned about global warming that their press release said, uh, the evidence is in that global warming represents a threat to human survival second only to nuclear war and called for a 20% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions in 15 years. So that was it. 1988, global warming was the issue of our time. The media had recognized it and promoted it as a problem. The climatologists had spoken and politicians had heard. What on earth happened then? Well, by 1992, when the largest gathering of of heads of state ever in human history up to that point was to take place in Rio. George Bush, who was now president, said, I'm not going down to that uh, meeting. I don't like the framework on, uh, on uh, climate. And he refused to attend. I remember being in Rio at that time, and American delegates were protesting in the streets, protesting George Bush's uh, refusal to come down. He said, I'll only come down if you change the target uh, from 50, a 20% reduction in 15 years. And so the final uh, target was set at stabilized 1990 levels by the year 2000. That, was, that became uh, the target. So there we see that uh, Mr. Bush, heavily involved with the uh, fossil fuel industry, then clearly indicated once he was president what his priorities were and knuckled that whole conference then into doing what he wanted, which is to give a very watered down uh, target, which we, we didn't meet anyway. In 1997, we met in Kyoto, and in, in Kyoto, it was decided the rich countries, the industrialized world, had created the problem of, of uh, global warming, and therefore it was the responsibility of the industrialized world to cap and then reduce our emissions by five to six percent. And one of the things Ian ought to be ashamed of, Australia was the only industrialized country that moaned and whinged so much they were allowed to increase, I think was it five percent or something above uh, 1990 levels. Um, Australia with all that sunlight, can you imagine? Anyway. Uh, so uh, the agreement then was uh, that the industrialized world had created the problem of global warming, that we would then lead the rest of the world by capping and reducing emissions by 5 to 6 percent by 2010, and by 2012 there would be an agreement then for all of the countries in the world. So the idea was let the, the developing world grow their economies while the industrialized world began to reduce their use of fossil fuels. As soon as the delegates returned from Kyoto in Canada, people began to say, well, I, we're not going to take a, a, a solution that's not made in Canada. We want a made in Canada solution. And how, what about the Chinese and what about the Indians? I mean, in Kyoto, everyone agreed the industrialized world had created the problem 
And it was our, uh, we had to set the example or else they would simply follow in the path that we had set. Canada, to our credit, ratified Kyoto in 2001. And if you ever come to visit the foundation, you'll see on the wall, we're very proud of a letter that came to us from Jean Chrétien thanking the foundation for the work that we had done and making his ratifying uh, possible. We, uh, Paul Martin, uh, followed uh, after all these shenanigans in Ottawa. Paul Martin replaced uh, Chrétien, and he understood what the environmental issues were. Indeed, he took on David Boyd, who had uh, written a document, Sustainability Within a Generation, that the Suzuki Foundation championed then as something we could spread across the country. David actually went to the Prime Minister's office where he worked on trying to implement the recommendations of sustainability within a generation. Paul understood what the challenges were, but he had difficulty really imposing a hard target on reducing fossil fuels. He had he was subsidizing uh, uh, you know, retrofits in, in big buildings, uh, insulating homes, and becoming more energy efficient, and so on. He certainly did uh, begin some, some sm small steps to moving away from fossil fuels. But of course, once Harper got in, all of those progressive steps that were in place were thrown out. And we had a government that did all it could to uh, keep us not only from hearing the words climate change or global warming, but to keep us from hearing what Canadian scientists were telling us about uh, climate change. And of course, he then presided, Stephen Harper presided uh, over the only country to withdraw from the uh, Kyoto Protocol. We, the foundation met with the French ambassador to Canada uh, a year before the conference in uh, Paris in uh, 2015. And uh, there I, I said, look, you've already had 20 meetings. This is going to be COP21. If all you're going to do is repeat the same thing that's gone on for 20 other meetings, forget it. It's a waste of time. And the ambassador said, I understand. We, we know that. And we have no intention of just copying uh, the, the steps taken in the past. And to his credit, and to France's credit, they did something that was very different, as you all know. Now we have 100% of countries, uh, even Yemen and uh, Grenada, which had dissented uh, from, from signing it. Grenada, because they didn't feel it was strong enough, the, uh, the target set in Paris. But um, th they had the rest of the world signed on, including the United States. And that, uh, I think, was a very, very important. When, when Canada went to Paris in 2015, not only did our brand new prime minister announce with a flourish that we were back, he said, look, the target is one and a half to two degrees in this century. We would much prefer reaching one and a half and keeping it there, which is a very hard target. So Canada embraced and showed leadership then in embracing the Paris targets of keeping temperature from rising above two degrees in this century. I emailed uh, Justin shortly after he came back and I said, that's a tough target. Are you serious about what you signed? And his answer was, I am very serious about Paris. So we went off and were praising him and writing columns and saying how great it was. And so to me, it was absolutely stunning when the uh, prime minister approved of, uh, of more pipelines. Yes, he, did, uh, he, he didn't uh, approve of Northern Gateway, but that was a, a foregone conclusion. There was no way that pipeline would ever go through. The uh, indigenous communities along the coast were absolutely adamant on, on that. There was no way. But uh, I then emailed him after he approved the Southern Route and, uh, and the Kinder Morgan expansion. And I asked him, why did you run for office? 
He would have made a great governor general. He takes great selfies, and he doesn't have to make commitments of any sort. But I said, why did you run for political office? Wasn't it to gain power, to do something? I said, you are now making decisions that are going to determine the kind of world your children will grow up in. Surely your children count more than your political career. You're in that position. Why aren't you doing the right thing for your children? And his response to that was to stop answering my emails. So the problem that I see we face is that uh, politicians are, they're, they're good people, they mean well, but they're constrained by politics. And the problem with the business community, I've met so many good people in the business community, but they're constrained by the priorities set by economics. And so we haven't been able to really uh, uh, change the way that we see the world. We're being driven now by a very strong economic and political agenda that uh, fails to understand that ultimately it's Mother Earth that allows us to live and flourish. And that's why I find uh, it so exciting today to see that indigenous people now are coming to the forefront. And this isn't just an issue of social justice, although it is a big issue of social justice. It's that we desperately need in the dominant society a different perspective through which to see our place on this planet. And that, uh, it's been my experience, is, comes from uh, the indigenous communities where we've been uh, fortunate to go to, to feasts and potlatches and memorials, funerals, and always in the songs and prayers and dances as they thank their creator for nature's abundance and generosity is a reciprocal, reciprocal commitment to, con, to carry out their responsibility to care for the earth. And this is something I think we fail to have in the dominant society. It's all, what opportunities can I take advantage of to add to the economy or whatever? But there isn't a reciprocity of responsibility towards the very things that keep us alive and healthy. And so uh, the Charged Up program, the, I, I meet so many people who say, look, I understand what you're saying about climate change, but forget it. You know, there's no way we can get off fossil fuels. It's too embedded in our economy, but also all of our infrastructure is built around oil. How can we possibly uh, change? And so what Charged Up is saying is it's happening. It's happening all over the world, including in Canada. And so the, to say it can't be done is no longer an excuse. It is being done. And if we are going to show a real commitment to achieving targets that we've signed on to in international agreements, we better take those examples very seriously and uh, be inspired by them to, uh, to get caught up in the revolution that is inevitable. And so I'm very pleased that we have people here who are going to share their stories and show you there is absolutely no excuse for holding back on this now. This is an enormous opportunity for us. So thank you for coming this evening and, uh, and uh, w waiting to, to hear some of the stories that you're going to hear from the following people. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, we have another real treat. Um, up next, we have three guests who are renewable community leaders uh, who are having a big impact. Um, I'll ask the three of you, Melina, um, Patrick, and Sadhu, if you would mind making your way up to the seats in the fireside chat area. Um, Melina Labacon Massimo is a member of the Lubicon Cree Nation from Northern Alberta. She's worked on social, environmental, and climate justice issues for the past 15 years. I think 10 of them were with Greenpeace, is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Melina is currently a fellow at the David Suzuki Foundation. 
lucky us. Uh, her research is focused on climate change, indigenous knowledge, and renewable energy. She'll also be hosting an upcoming documentary series called Power to the People, which will air on APTN uh, next year. Uh, Chief Patrick Michel, right next to Melina, is a member of the Inkla Katma Nation. He has a Bachelor of Law from UBC and worked with DFO and INAC before articling with the Ministry of the Attorney General in Victoria. He practiced law until 2005 when he decided to work for the Ka'i'ik Run of River Hydro Project that is community developed in partnership with Interjax. Um, in 2015, he was elected Chief of Kanaka Bar and he remains a uh, big proponent of renewable energy. Uh, last but not least, Sadhu Johnston is the city manager with the city of Vancouver. He's been actively involved in the implementation of the Healthy City Strategy, the Transportation 2040 Plan, the Clean City Action Plan, including the Renewable City Strategy, among many other files, and has played an active role as well in the city's reconciliation initiatives. Wow. Um, welcome and over to you. So uh, how do you, Sherry, do you want me to ask any questions? I didn't know how you sure. wanted to do yeah, this. that would be great. And I think you guys should have two mics there that you yeah. can share between yeah. the two okay. of you. But if you just want to find out kind of what yeah. work they do. And okay, and I've got it turned on. Yeah. Okay, no, I've got, uh, oh, I've got, got my own mic. Okay. So let's just uh, get into it. Uh, Melina, tell us. You know, you're you're from Alberta in a remote community. How the heck did renewable energy become a part of? Uh, well, tell us about your community first and how renewable energy came up. So, Tansekwakia, Nia Melina Miowap in Lubokan, Masmonia, Nihiao, Kineskumtanawa. It's an honor and privilege to be here on Coast Salish territory, and I wanted to acknowledge the Coast Salish people for allowing me to be here as a visitor. And I, I am from a Lubicon Cree community, which is in northern Alberta, remote community um, in the Peace River region in the Tar Sands. It's in Tar Sands impacted community. So I grew up, um, I was born into a very small Cree community um, and was born and raised around essentially that type of development, which was a pretty intense kind of realization to come to um, as I grew older, seeing the impacts to the land, to the water, to the air. In traditionally, in our traditional, you know, territory, um, and so as a young person, I started realizing, why aren't we talking about this? Why aren't we talking about resource extraction? Why don't I know more about this? Why doesn't my family know more about this? So I decided to, my um, my master's degree, my initial part of my master's degree was um, about environmental studies and researching the tar sands because people weren't telling us this information. So that was my initial. Um, research and my final research was um, after a massive oil spill back home um, and seeing how it impacted my family and community and how people couldn't breathe and you know the school was shut down, um, health impacts, land, air quality impacts. Um, I realized you know it's not enough just to talk about these issues all the time because at, at that point I've been traveling talking about the research you know in across Canada and to America and to, into Europe trying to have divestment, you know, from the the impacts um, from the tar sands, and realized if I can't stop the impacts as much um, with, with this massive oil spill, how can I start producing like positive solutions for our communities? I can talk about it as much as I want until I'm blue in the face and say no, no, no. But what does our yes look like? And for me, that's how renewable energy came about. And for finalizing my master's was, I'm going to actually put up a solar project. I'm going to figure out how to fundraise for a solar project. I'm going to figure out how to put it up from start to finish. And that was essentially what I felt like it was a way to give back to my community, um, to train their young people, to see um, how we do this, and how do we connect to the grid, and how do we learn about renewable energy as a solution. Um, at that point, there wasn't many projects up. Um, in, in Alberta that's slowly changing with renewable energy policy that's now being introduced in, um, but at the time there wasn't that. How did your community respond when you started to say, gee, I think we could put some solar panels in here? I mean, people were like, oh, that's interesting, um, and, but people wanted to see it. The thing is that people, indigenous communities, um, the type of uh, 
t this type of technology is a lot more, you know, the reciprocity that you're speaking of. We see in, um, this type of technology more in line with indigenous values because it's more regenerative. It's not as extractive as fossil fuels. So a lot of communities, and that's why what Sherry was saying earlier was, you know, a thousand communities and 150 like large scale projects in indigenous communities across this country. It's because people, we have been living the brunt of environmental degradation and the brunt of resource extraction. And so we very are very much have seen what the devastation that it causes. So how can we utilize a technology that's actually regenerative and something that empowers our communities in a way that um, you know allows people to be more inspired so that's why you know people took it on and people thought too people were like oh you know someone might throw throw rocks at this project and you know and what if that happens and this project's been up for you know um, will be three years this summer and there's not been a rock ever thrown at this project because people people see the project as something that is exciting, you know, something that, that the community has been a part of since breaking ground, so yeah. Well, I think it's a really inspiring story, but I have to ask you to go back and tell us, you had a major spill in your community. Tell us what the response of the authorities, our government, was to that. Well, this was actually during the Harper era, um, which you talked about, um, and so it was just pushed under the carpet. Um, it was. It actually took um, the election, the second election, um, so 2011, was essentially, there was no information given to my community. So it was essentially um, my auntie who taught Cree in the school for 30, you know, 30 plus years and was texting me and saying, our eyes are burning, we're nauseous, um, like the kids, we have to shut down the school. We thought it was a propane spill, so we went outside and we couldn't still breathe and it was worse outside actually. And so I went online and started looking because she knew what I, the work that I did. And the only thing I could find was a business website informing the business community and the oil and gas sector that there was a shutdown and a pipeline because of a spill. And that's all the information that I could give my family. And so essentially not until after the, the federal election, they released the information to the community that it was one of the biggest oil spills in Alberta's history and Canada's history. And it was, um, you know, millions of, of Leaders, so it was just you know twenty eight thousand barrels. It was huge, and so it was just spilled all all over. And so it was so hard to get the information. It was just swept under the carpet, and so I couldn't even get a helicopter to fly us over. It was literally I was telling you earlier. It was like people were hanging up on me, saying like we're not going to fly you because of we're just in oil and gas country. And so we finally found somebody that did logging um, a logging contract with our nation to finally fly over our own traditional territory to find to take pictures, and we had to fight with a company to. Even get into the spill site where people, you know, have hunted traditionally, where people pick berries and medicines, and so these are the type of things where, I, for me, I already been fighting pipelines with the Enbridge pipeline, and then that's why it's so important for me to go into communities to talk to communities about the impacts of a spill because it was, it was probably at that time one of the hardest experiences I've ever had in my life of how people, um, how it affected my family and how it affected me. Um, it was very traumatizing. So I, I wanted you to tell, talk about that because this is a province that is saying we want that pipeline through BC and you don't have the right to even think about what the consequences might be of a spill. Spill is inevitable somewhere. And I mean, it's in, indicative that they don't, that's a province that is so heavily under the influence of the fossil fuel industry. They don't want to allow that kind of information out. So I think British Columbians should think about that uh, in terms of Kinder Morgan. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Thank you, Melina. Thank you. Chief Patrick, I wonder if you could uh, tell us where you're from, what your, how your community uh, got involved in the renewable uh, energy area. So with those words, I simply say, hi, my name is Patrick, and uh, thanks to Koshalish. What it actually says is, hello friends, my name is Chief Patrick and thank you, Shiashinko is our word for the Stalo people. So this is important because the start of Kanakabar's story starts 8,000 years ago. Located 14 kilometers south of uh, the confluence of the Fraser and Thompson Rivers is a small community known as Klaklukton, or the Crossing Place. On June 21st, 1808, a man in a canoe showed up, dumped his canoe, and while he was picking up his canoe, he wrote in his journal, 
I'm located at this unusual location where to the right of me is old growth cedar and Douglas fir and to the left of me is ponderosa pine and desert. Kanaka Bar is located on the north end of the Fraser Canyon and for 8,000 years my ancestors used the land and resources there to live and we lived sustainably. Shortly after Simon Fraser showed up, the gold rush started and in a recent article, you can read it uh, from the National Observer, turns out my ancestors stopped American Manifest Destiny but don't tell the Americans. In 1857 and 1858, we killed American gold miners. And, but you know what happens when you throw an American gold miner in a river with his head off? They come back like Hydra. <laughs> So what happened was, so the first contact we had with colonization wasn't all that bad. They had stuff we wanted. Stinky fur, denim pants, cedar basket with hot rock or copper petal. So we, you know what, it was actually a great 50 first years. It was when they introduced greed, right? And then it all went sideways after that. My ancestor, my great-grandfather, Chief Charlie Michel, wrote in 1910 and reiterated several times later, and uh, the document is called the, the Memorial to Sir Wilfrid Lawyer. He says, you can't do this. It's not sustainable. Cut it out. But nothing changed. In celebrating Canada's 150th, 100th birthday, I didn't know the man, right? But somebody gave an Indian a microphone and 32,000 live people. And you know what, it, you know what an Indian's going to say when you give him a microphone? There's no way you know because I don't know what I'm going to say. Chief Dan George says, oh, Canada, why would I celebrate 100 years of you raping the land people and the resources? It's not sustainable. Be careful when you give an Indian a microphone. It's not sure what they're going to say. That was 1967. Okay? The warnings have always been there. Stephen has just told us at the beginning we're living with climate change. Dr. Suzuki just said, we're aware of that in 1988. My community says, guess what? We're in the age of consequence. We're experiencing adverse climate change effects on the ground as we speak. Drought, wind, rain patterns, fires, and it's growing in intensity, frequency, and duration. And you know what we say at Kanaka Bar? Gee, didn't see that coming. <laughs> Actually, we did. In 1978, two years after the residential school closed, you know what we did? We got to get off the pity pot. Bad things happened to good people. Somehow we have to go back to the ways of their ancestors. And for 10 years, we were looking for an opportunity to take back who we were. And in 1988, BC Hydro decided to do something crazy. They created an, its first IPP policy. Hmm, Canada's hot spot, my place, a.k.a. sun. The wind always blows north, the trees plant one, uh, grow one way, and I've got seven creeks of year-round water. Hmm, what do, we, what do we call that industry today? Solar, wind, hydro. We've considered biomass, but if you've got a lot of sun, wind, and water, why would you have to go with biomass? Geothermal, we think, is the craziest thing ever because why would you bleed Mother Earth, right? And because I'm from the interior, wind and tidal, sorry, tidal and, and what's the other one? Wave action ain't working. And I don't care what the pr provincial government says, LNG is still carbon-based. So that is not a renewable energy source. So... With the, with the opening up of the grid, Kanaka Bar went out and did something crazy insane. Don't tell anybody, but we actually own all the water licenses in my traditional territory. <laughs> because if you're going to get into a hydro, you need the water license. Right? Not to worry about the sun and the wind. Right? The water license is an asset. So in 1988, we said, okay, what are we going to do? In 1990, we applied for the water license. And by 2000, we were ready. We applied to the EAO and we sabotaged our own project because we were getting too big. So the EAO came out with 53 project specifications and we went, oh, no, didn't see that coming. No, I authored the letter that sabotaged our first project because it was inconsistent with First Nations values. Maximizing and optimizing a project promoted greed. 
We just needed to do something, and we just needed to do something right. We found a new partner in Energex in, oh, I don't know, let's call it 2003. And with Energex, we then finished off, we addressed the EAO specifications, and in 2006, we got an EPA through BC Hydro, and we built it. And in 2011, we did a groundbreaking ceremony, and in 2014, we're certified operational. Okay? You all wonder why I wear colors, right? There it is. Red man meets white man, has black history, but incredible future together brought about by the renewable energy sector. We call this logo collaboration. What we did with our first project, we could not have done without the assistance of third parties like Energex and the federal and provincial government. Notwithstanding, David, we used to say, help us or just stay the hell out of our way. Usually they just helped us. So the end result was we have a 50 megawatt project operating at Kanaka Bar, and it's providing enough electricity year round. For example, Dave, we're producing electricity right now. Most run of the river projects aren't because it's built at a smaller level. It's not optimized. We're just taking enough and therefore we run year round. So we're generating electricity for 20,000 homes. But Kanaka Bar has also got a six kilowatt solar ground unit, similar to the one behind us, powering our administration building. Been running since June of 2016. We liked it so much, or sure it may, we built another one. We call it the pillar unit, which is powering our health center, right? So that's a ground solar unit, a pillar solar unit. Down below in the old gravel pit, we actually have a solar project off grid. Remember, it's Canada's hotspot. We didn't actually do any sun data. We just knew the sun shined, right? So we are powering a, a standalone system with battery storage in our gravel pit. And what it does is it has light bulbs, security cameras, a, a computer, and it beams it back. So if anybody's over stealing my rocks, I know. I really do. People do come to Kanaka to steal rocks. I, makes no sense. By the end of this month, uh, March, sorry, we'll have our four, our six kilowatt solar tracker up and running, powering the maintenance building. And uh, obviously, we've got a lot of other things on the road where we're going to just keep expanding solar. And uh, we've got a 500 kilowatt uh, run of the river project in final design stage. So, why? because we're using the sun and the wind and the water the same way my ancestors did, sustainably. There's no extraction. You're harnessing Mother Nature's bounty without damage. And my ancestors said, if you're gonna use the land and resources, make sure there's the same or more for future generations. That is my instructions. I cannot extract. I can only use, and I must, make sure there's something for my future generations. Thank you very much. So, Sadhu Johnson was brought here from Chicago to, to assist our mayor who wanted to make Vancouver the greenest city in the world by 2020. What did you find when you got here? Tell us about uh, the development of that plan. Well, you... Uh you, you know what happens when you give a bureaucrat a microphone, right? <laughs> they don't say very much, so. Um, yeah, I came here about nine years ago. I was uh, greening Chicago, and um, it's been amazing to work here in Vancouver. I mean, Vancouver has a multi, multi-generational legacy of being a leader in this area. And uh, I think in the last number of years, we've really propelled Vancouver onto a world stage as a leader. Um, with that said, we still have a really long way to go. Um, you know, I just, that's a disclaimer here. We're, uh, we're on a journey to discover how we as a city can be a 100% renewably powered city. And uh, this leg of the journey, I think, started with uh, the Clouds of Change report that came out in the 90s that, that started to recognize that cities play a critical role in this, that it's, this is not just about people in their daily lives, but the, the, we play a role in the way that we build these cities and the way that we support our businesses and residents to live sustainable lifestyles. So that was kind of the beginning of our journey. Um, and uh, about 10 years ago, council adopted the Green City Action Plan, which really said we need to look in 10 areas for how we can be a green city. 
And uh, so since then, uh, since 2007 about, we've reduced our GHG emissions per capita by about 18%. And in that time, we've grown our population and grown our job base. We're, we've increased uh, green jobs by 49% in our community. So it's really, I think in some ways, Vancouver demonstrates that green cities are, are good for the economy, actually, as well. Um, and so as, as a community, those steps that we've made are saving, have saved about $38 million from residents and businesses on energy costs in our community by building more energy efficient buildings, building around transit, that kind of thing. And so it's uh, good for the bottom line as well. It was about uh, 2015 that council said, this is great, love where we're going with, with GHG emissions, but we really want to be 100% renewably powered city. And uh, you know what a bureaucrat does when you give them a really aggressive target, right? They cringe. Um, we were, it was a little scary, to be honest, because it's, uh, a lot of cities have said we want to be 100% renewably powered. Well, a number had at that but time. what does that mean? Does exactly. That... What does that mean? And was, we started to look around a lot of different cities and said, well, for this part of our energy, for that part of our energy, our target was 100%. Buildings, transportation, cooking fuels. And so we set about looking at how can we do that? And we actually developed a plan, and council adopted that plan. And what I can tell you is that it's doable. Our target is to be 100% renewably powered before 2050, and we're on that track. Wow. The first part of that is really, and, and, and Patrick was asking me, why don't I see more solar and I, and I come into the city? Why don't I see more, more wind? And really our first focus in that plan is reduce the energy that we consume. And that's been a major, major focus for us. We have some of the greenest buildings in the world. We're seeing passive houses coming now. We've, we've really integrated that into our building codes. And so we, we got to drive down the energy that we consume. And that's been a pillar of our plan. The second part of our plan is to use the renewable power that we already have out there with more EVs and, other, and sources like that. And then the third is to produce more renewable. And uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of, we were talking about politics earlier. What's amazing to me, uh, last week, council passed uh, staff recommendation to increase our renewable energy facility. We have a district energy facility here. We take waste sewer heat. This is, you know, you run your dishwasher, all that hot water goes down into the sewers and gets wasted. Well, at that facility, we're able to take the heat out of that sewer water and heat an entire neighborhood. And last week, council unanimously adopted a plan to almost triple the size of that district energy facility so we can provide, provide renewable energy to people throughout False Creek to power a hospital with it. And so we're on a journey, really proud of where we're going. And I think it's, it comes out of the foundation of our community support for this. It started years ago when the highway was stopped going through this community. And, uh, and it continues and it's really driven by, I think the passion commitment of our businesses, our residents in Vancouver to keep pushing us to do more. As you know, political regimes come to an end, usually after eight to 10 years, uh, we get a change in order for these this commitment and this activity to really go beyond uh, these time periods, there, there has to be something embedded in the city itself. It has to be a part of our identity, our pride, our culture. Is, do you think that uh, is sufficiently embedded to withstand whoever is elected in the next election? I think so. I mean, I think, um, uh, yeah, it's, the drive is, is from the residents that want this kind of community. It doesn't mean there aren't political battles. We've had a few of them. I've got a few scars from it. Um, there are very heavy lifts to do still. Uh, difficult challenges, battles to be had. We've talked about Kinder Morgan. We've taken a very strong position on that over the years. We need political leadership to continue to drive this and we need our residents to continue to expect that from, from our politicians. But a lot of what we've done is changing the building codes, changing the zoning codes. I mean, a lot of the, those steps live on. Requiring renewal, requiring um, solar readiness, requiring EV charging, requiring energy efficient buildings, all of that is, is built into the DNA of our bureaucracy at this point, which is you can't turn away, you can't turn that back, but we, we need ongoing leadership to continue to forge ahead. You know, whenever I fly over a forest and look down, all I see are green things going, give it to me. <laughs> now you fly over Vancouver, and all you see are the flat roofs of buildings, warehouses, roads, sidewalks. 
it seems to me that we claim that we're a clever animal. We should be able to harvest the sun in the same way that plants do uh, everywhere on the planet. Are there, are there heavy thinkers that are thinking that way? How do we turn a, a city into a forest? Yeah, um, and it's not just harvesting the sun. I mean, harvesting the water. Right now, we capture all the water and put it into sewer pipes. We mix it with sewage. I mean, it's just trying to think about our city as an ecosystem, where what we do is, is contributing, is, is really a part of what we're trying to do. Um, some of those rooftops are, are wonderful as green roofs, as playgrounds, you know, looking at the different things that we can use with those rooftops. District energy is a great example. Right now, you look at a lot of buildings, you've got a lot of energy, you've got cooling towers and stuff like that. With a district energy system, you don't need all that on the roof, so you can turn the roof into something else. We can produce solar or have a green roof, a playground, that kind of thing. So I think that's, it's, it's that, but it's also we adopted a biodiversity strategy, an urban forest strategy, a bird-friendly strategy. So looking at, as we build new buildings, we've got bird-friendly design guidelines. How are we designing them so that they aren't beacons to attract birds during their mig migration, um, as an example? So those are, that's something we're trying to do, is to build it again into the DNA of how we, how we build our city. One final question. There was this group C40. I don't know whether it's been expanded to C80 or not, but uh, Canadian David Miller is now the, the head of this. Uh, can you tell us a little of, of what that is and how Vancouver sits within that uh, grouping? Yeah. C40. So what, um, just to step back, probably 10 years ago, folks started to realize that cities were key to this, and over half the world's population are living in cities, and we need, we need global leadership from our cities particularly in the context of Bush and others that were, were not working on the federal level. And so City said, we're going to step up and we're going to lead. And um, so they joined together. The 40 largest cities in the world said, we're going to lead on carbon, and they, they called it C40. And, uh, and, and as they started to work together around reducing carbon, they realized they, need, they kind of need some leading cities to help share their experiences. And so... We got in, Vancouver got in, because we're not one of the largest 40 cities. We got in as an innovator city to, to be a city that could contribute some of our experiences. And so we are a member of C40. And uh, some of our staff lead working groups, like uh, our staff lead a district energy working group. We're very involved in a lot of what they're doing. And actually, last weekend, there was a meeting of C40 in which uh, uh, Councillor Andrea Reimer and, and Gregory Robertson, our mayor, went to Mexico City and met. And one of the things that they pledged, actually, was to join the C40 cities in creating a, a Women in Climate Reduction in Cities initiative, an, an apprenticeship program to really bring more women into, uh, into leadership positions in cities to help support this, this field. So um, it's live and well. We are very active members and learning a lot from other places and trying to contribute our experiences so that we can do even, have even more impact than just our own uh, operations here in Vancouver, but that we can share our lessons. Is there an indigenous component in that? Uh, in no, the there, 40s? Because there I, hasn't been, mm -hmm. actually, uh, traditionally. There because hasn't I been. think what, what is, for me at least, what is offered by indigenous uh, communities is a change in perspective, it's a, which to me is the biggest impediment to, to really getting going on the, on the changes that are needed. Uh, if you regard the earth as your mother, it seems to me you treat it in a radically different way than if you simply regard it as a source of resources. Um, anyway, so interesting. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I uh, think that what we've got is, uh, is intriguing insights into these three people. And rather than push the conversation, lead the conversation, I'd like to open it up. I think the inspiration is there. It seems to me the only impediment now to going ahead with really leading this revolution is, is mental. It's, uh, the evidence is in, it works, it's necessary, and uh, I just wonder whether anyone here wants to, to use the experience these people uh, represent to try to uh, find out how you, uh, you can take advantage of it. Yeah. So uh, I'm a real estate developer, uh, born and raised in Vancouver. Um, been the, the uh, hostage of, of tradition. Um, yeah, yeah I, I've, I'm a real estate developer, uh, born and raised in Vancouver, and I've uh, 
watched the industry and we've been, I've been kind of a, a victim of, of just doing what everybody else does and that's just pouring concrete and building towers in the sky. And the whole notion of climate change and, and the environment, uh, while I was sensitive to it, I wasn't as plugged in until I started to get to know David and, and the foundation. And corporately, we recently, you know, we, we did the Hotel Georgia, we started to work with Geo Exchange, which actually works really, really good. Um, and we're, we're now in a direction where we're 100% committed to really reaching around the corner, working with the city of Vancouver, especially because I like to, you know, compliment uh, Sidhu and, and, and the staff because they've written some amazing documents about where we got to go. Um, there's a lot of other priorities, but one of them is this notion of excellence and zero emissions and, and corporately we're following that. But, you know, I look around my, my colleagues and they're all still going down the path of doing what they've all done. And, and I'm out there, I don't know anyone else who's trying to do what we're doing, but to, do, I, I, you know, I, to you I'd say, you know, building beautiful concrete buildings and you know, trying to improve, I mean, why aren't we taking a bigger leap is I guess the question and you know, why aren't there more people doing it? Well, I'll jump in. Um, well, we've, we've been in a learning curve for our, um, as a city as well. We, we're unique in that we have our own ability. Unique is one of the few in the country, cities that can write our own building codes. And so it does provide a unique opportunity for us to test things and, and uh, try them out and then others, other cities can, can adopt those building codes. And for a long time, we were following something called ASHRAE, which is a standard system of energy savings. Um, and energy performance, and what we realized is um, we weren't actually achieving the results that we wanted, which is actually lower greenhouse gas emissions from those buildings. Um, and so one of, we were one of the first cities in North America, uh, certainly, um, and one of the first in the world, um, although Europe's been leading at this, to, to come up with performance standards. So not to tell you how you, how do you want to have to build your building, but to create GHG emissions, so th kind of thermal performance standards and to say, can you achieve these standards? And that, that's really helped to shape provincial building codes as well. And uh, now we have two, I think three, of the first passive house high-rise buildings that are underway in Vancouver in the world. And passive house uses about 80 to 90% less energy than a standard building, and so it means less glass. <laughs> it means, you know, it's all thermal breaks, so you don't all just have a glass facade. And so it's, that's amazing to see the kind of uptake that's coming out of the private sector that wants to lead and in certain cases we kind of got to get out of the way and not have barriers in our own building codes and the way that we engage with the industry to do that. Um, so I think it's a lot of it's the way we approach it instead of saying you have to do these 10 things it's this is where we want you to go. Use your ingenuity to help us figure out how to get there and so I think we're seeing a bit of a shift there at least here in Vancouver and we're trying to do it ourselves we're building the, per, the first passive house certified fire hall in, in the world that we know of, which has big doors and a lot of it's going to have uh, solar on it. And so, you know, those are some of the things that we're trying to do in our own, in our own buildings to lead. Did you want to add to that? How does mankind think? We got this two kilogram thing here from about 150,000 years ago, Dave. And the answer to your question is, Right there. Until such time as mankind can figure out a way to make a buck off the renewable energy sector, you ain't gonna see it. The question is, Kanakabar has invested in a whole bunch of solar and reduced our operating costs down to zero, but we're not making money. But we reduced our operating costs down to zero. All we had to do is put in four more panels and I'd be making profit. Problem is, I'm not profit motivated. If you put solar on your property in Vancouver, you will get a capital gains. If you put in $25,000 of solar, you can sell it to the next guy three years from now for a hundred grand. Solarize your houses. Somebody's gonna wanna buy your house cause it's solar, not your house, cause it's not solar. 
Make the capital gains investment today and you'll get a $75,000 return tomorrow. Developer, real estate developer, turn your houses into renewable energy things. There's a brand new people out there with money who want to go green. Governments need to get out of the way and allow solar and wind to be installed on their commercial and uh, housing projects. Do they? Have they passed the bylaws that allow for renewable energy development in the neighborhoods? I don't know. You have to ask Stephen. Right. We're not in the way, are we? If there was, right? The permitting process. 36 years for our first hydro project, six years into our next, for what? 17 to 20 year payback. Renewable energy, license to print slow money. That's why nobody's doing it. Think differently. That's what you said. It's not about the money. It's never been about the money. It's about developing a self-sufficient and sustainable community for us. Money? Well, that's just a byproduct because we can't eat money. David, should people uh, come down so they can? Well, or or get this one of the mics up there is what. We got a runner. We got a runner. <laughs> and fossil fuels in general. I just wondered what you see as the relationship between renewable energy and the fossil fuel uh, corporations. Are they irrelevant? Are they potential partners? Or are they active opponents? So that's one question. The second one is for Sadhu, and that's, um, I, I understand that 75% of the world's mining companies are based in Canada, and many of them are in, based in Vancouver, in fact. Um, and their environmental and human rights records internationally is not stellar. Um, in many cases, and I wondered if that's on your radar screen of uh, making Vancouver um, a green city. So, two questions. Did you? Uh... Yeah, um, I'll take the first one. Um, so, I mean, I think there is an interesting link between um, fossil fuel companies and the renewable energy sector, and I think it's a contentious one and will be a contentious one moving into the future. I think um, kind of a being from a fossil fuel impacted community where a lot of the communities that have this around us are facing the brunt, like I said, of this type of environmental degradation, but not necessarily seeing as the impact, the, the benefits as much as the impacts. And I think from that, um, sometimes seeing, you know, big companies like Suncor or Enbridge or um, various different com companies then turn around, make a profit from the destruction of our homelands and also the climate. Um, turn around and, and then reinvest into renewable energy, I feel kind of a little bit um, worrisome because um, essentially it's kind of a continuation of, take, of maintaining monopoly of the grid or not monopoly of the energy matrix. Um, and so I feel like that's kind of a little bit concerning, whereas the thing that I really love about Charged Up is actually talking about community-based energy, where communities actually own their energy, communities actually run their energy, communities are starting to become energy literate, so they actually know how the energy system works. And so I think that's something that has been left out of our national and you know dialogue period, our really global dialogue of people are really energy literate, unfortunate, and, and I think more people in this room are a lot more energy literate, but you talk to anybody on the street and people are not energy literate, and I think that's why the oil and gas companies continue to kind of rule. And I think the thing that I really appreciate about Charged Up is, is, is putting the knowledge and the power back into the hands of the communities that are actually going to be um, affect, you know, the ones that are affected by this type of environmental policy. And I think we need to see strong, progressive, renewable energy policy in every jurisdiction um, to ensure that communities are able to be equity partners, to be you know, owning their own renewable energy systems. Because if we continue to see megalithic kind of site seed dams that are es essentially competing with small scale run of the river hydro, it's going to become a problem. And so we actually need to see more community-based renewable energy initiatives and not it continually be out of the hands of communities and into, you know, multinational 
oil and gas companies that at the end of the day, what we know in the economy is that it's about profit, it's not about the communities, and that's what I see as problematic. And I really hope to see community-based renewable energy flourish, um, but we need to see strong um, governmental policy, but we also need to get all communities across from coast to coast involved in this type of transition so we can um, really harness and be a part of the solution, but also control and empower our communities to do so. So, thank you. Renewable energy pipelines. Is there a correlation? Absolutely. Cynical Charlie and Negative Nelly will tell you that the oil and gas industry bends the ear of politicians who make wonky decisions. That's not true, is it? Because our federal and provincial governments, are we subsidizing the oil and gas industry? <laughs> Take away the subsidy, get ready to pay seven to eight dollars a liter, and you will see renewable energy take off like you've never seen before. End the subsidy. Politicians, stop it. As the consumer, you will say, hmm, seven dollars a liter or electric vehicle. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. End the subsidy. That's your answer. Is there a correlation? Yes. Sadie, do you want to make a comment? I was hoping you could answer question number two, actually, Melina. What? Oh. Uh, um, the question was, what are we doing about uh, industries that may be headquartered here that have practices that, um, that may be questionable elsewhere, mining and whatnot? Mm. And um, it, to be honest, it's not something that we've really gotten involved with. Really, what we're trying to do is to forge the way for the future economy in Vancouver and to set the stage for the green and clean tech economies um, and to get people that may not be in the job market at all to get into the green sector with recycling and other businesses. So that's more of where our focus has been. And uh, so we've really, we've really tried through the Vancouver Economic Commission, which has been, a, I think, a, a national leader on this, and in, in our efforts to, to just get that kind of activity going in, this, in the Vancouver, in the, in the tech sector. I could, I mean, I guess I could comment a bit on the, the mining because, you know, I've made trips down south to the communities that are impacted by, our, you know, the Canadian mining sector um, in Ecuador and the Sariaku um, in Guatemala, um, visiting with communities that are severely impacted by these type of mining that is, you know, basically coming out of here in Vancouver. And I think it's very problematic because, you know, what I, from my understanding too, on the Toronto Stock Exchange, there's less regulations in, in Canada than there is even in, in the U.S. on the New York Stock Exchange, and that's really problematic. So I think it's, it's really up to Canadians to to be aware and holding these types of mining companies accountable to um, the human rights abuses as well as the environmental degradation that Canadian companies are causing elsewhere in the world. And it's just, you know, um, essentially one of the communities that I visited a number of years back um, in Ecuador, you know, their, their very lives are being threatened. This just this January, um, Patricia Guelinga, who's one of the members that I visited, um, you know, had death threats um, and attacks at her house. So I think, you know, it's very important as can, that for Canadian citizens and people that live in Canada that maybe aren't Canadian citizens that but are very um, whole, having solidarity with these types of communities that once again just like our communities are experiencing the detrimental impacts of resource extraction and there's not accountability to these companies um, and we need to hold these companies accountable um, you know across the board so thank you yeah. sorry can I add just a to the first question just on fossil fuel companies, I mean, we talked about Kinder Morgan, but it, with our renewable city strategy that I, that I mentioned, um, as we were um, kind of rolling that out, there was a lot of support, um, but as we started to implement it, um, we started to um, get into conflict with Fortis, our, our gas provider here, because I think they were starting to realize that we were serious about it and that it might impact their business. Um, and so we, we started to have a bit of a fight with them and it got public and it, it got nasty um, in which there was campaigns you know, um, we, we, that were banning natural gas and um, you know, they started to campaign to save my natural gas and, and it was really stopped being productive um, for them or for us. 
because ultimately they're spending a fair amount on energy efficiency. They really do want to green their infrastructure. And so our staff, um, the team, the team, the city um, that work on this, said, you know, we got we, we to change the dynamic here. And so we set up a meeting with the senior uh, staff at Fortis and uh, hosted in my office, and a number of them and a number of us. And I said, like, look, look at your website and everything you're doing. There's a lot of alignment here with what we're trying to achieve. And they said, well, we recognize we're going to go to 100% renewable energy. It's how we get there and the timing by which we get there. And so we sat, we, after a couple of, we worked together for a couple of months and we signed an MOU, which their CEO and our mayor signed, in which we mapped out how are we going to work together to transition to 100% renewably powered community. And we made some concessions around timing and phasing so that uh, they, could, they could work on it in a way that they could, they could deal with in their own infrastructure plans. And they committed to working with us on a number of things. We're, there, we're partnering with them, um, taking uh, methane out of our landfill and cleaning it and putting it into pipes so we can use it in city facilities and other people here can buy it. And we're working with them on transition with some of our vehicles. And so there's, you know, what came out of it was a recognition that we have actually more in common than we don't. We, we, they recognize where we're going. We need to be sensitive to their infrastructure plans and whatnot as we get there. And so we're buying renewable natural gas in City Hall. That's how we've gone carbon neutral in City Hall. And we're you know, trying to, when we do need to use natural gas, buy renewable natural gas so that that supports the industry to put more of it in the system. And so you know, I think that's, uh, for us, it's, it's been an important journey in, in trying to get out of that fight to recognize that there's a lot that we, we do have in common if we can work toward it. I still think the challenge is that the corporate agenda, I mean, these are good good human beings like in any other area, but they are driven by one thing, which is profit. And, you know, the more you can make and the faster, the better. So I'm sorry for the people that have heard me tell this story, but I've, I, I think it's an uh, appropriate moment to talk about a corporation that did call me, the CEO of one of the largest companies in the tar sands four years ago, and asked if he would come and see me. I said, of course, I'm not into fighting. I, I, we've all got to work together. So he came down and uh, the next day, and, and when I greeted him, I thanked him and said what an honor and blah, all that stuff. And then I said, before you come in my office, I want you to leave your identity as a CEO of an oil company outside the door. I want to meet you as one human being to another. Because I don't see the point of negotiating until we both agree on the fundamental platform that we share. Otherwise, we're negoti negotiating all over the place. So to his, you, you could tell by his body language, he did not come down for that. He came down as a CEO of an oil company. But to his credit, he came through the door. And so I thanked him when he sat down. I said, look, I know this is what you expected. But I said, what I'm thinking is we have to agree that we live in a world that is shaped and constrained by laws of nature. And there's nothing you can do about that. We have to live within that, those laws. So physics tells you you can't build a rocket that will travel faster than speed of light. You know that. The law of gravity says if I trip on this platform, I'm going to hit my head on the floor. First and second law of thermodynamics mean you can't build a perpetual motion machine. Those are all fundamental facts that are dictated by the laws of physics. Chemistry, it's the same. The atomic property of the elements determine the melting point, the freezing point, the boiling point, the reaction rates, diffusion constants. All of that is set by the property of, of the elements. And there's nothing you can do about that. You live within it. And in biology, it's the same. Every species of plant and animal has a maximum number that can be achieved. And if you exceed that number, then the population will crash. That's determined by what ecologists call the carrying capacity of an ecosystem or a habitat. Humans aren't confined to habitats or, or, or ecosystems. We're smart. We adapt to many different conditions. But the biosphere, the zone of air, water, and land where all life exists, that's our home. And it's finite. And uh, of course, the number of humans that can be carried is determined by a number. And, and uh, consumption per person. But every scientist I've talked to agrees we are already way past the carrying capacity of the planet, even if we lived the, at the level of Bangladeshis or, or Somalians. They're just, we're, we're exceeding the carrying capacity of the planet. 
And then I said, uh, Mr. CEO, you and I are animals. And as animals, what do you think is the most important thing that we need? And instead of giving us an answer immediately, as every one of you would, he went, uh, well, I, and I knew he was thinking money and job. I said, you know, if you don't have air for three minutes, you're dead. If you have to breathe polluted air, you're sick. So I'm asking you, would you agree that clean air is a sacred trust that we have a responsibility to do everything we can to keep pure air? And then I said, you and I are 60 to 70 percent water. You know, we're basically a big blob of water with enough thickener added so we don't dribble away on the floor. <laughs> but our bodies leak water, right? It comes out of our skin and our eyes and our crotch and we lose water all the time. I said, Mr. CEO, if you don't have water for four to six days, you're dead. If you have to drink polluted water, you're sick. So is clean water like clean air a sacred trust? that we have a responsibility to protect. And then I said, food's a bit different, but four to six weeks without food, you die. Most of our food comes from the soil. So clean soil and food then joins air water. And finally, all of the energy in our bodies that we need to move and grow and reproduce all and do work, all of that is sunlight captured by plants in photosynthesis, converted into chemical energy, and we get it by eating the animals or the plants. That eat, uh, the animals that eat the plants are the plants. And we store it. And when we need to work, we burn those molecules and liberate the energy of the sun back out in our bodies. Those are dictated realities that we, nothing we can do about that, we live within that. Other things, like borders we draw around our property, our cities, our provinces, our country, those are not forces of nature. We drew them. Nature couldn't give two hoots about those borders. Yet we ask everything to fit along our jurisdictions and, and boundaries that we create. And then we invent things like capitalism, like the economy, like currency, like markets, like political parties, governments, uh, corporations. These are not created out of laws of nature. Those are human inventions. Those are the only things we can change and manage are what we create. You can't shoehorn nature to fit our demands or our agenda. I said, Mr. CEO, if you will shake hands with me on that understanding, I will do everything I can to help you and your company. And of course, he, the result was that he couldn't shake hands with me. How could he go back to his shareholders and say, I had a discussion with Suzuki and I have to agree. Whatever our company does, we can't mess with the air, the water, the soil. He'd get fired so fast because that's not his job. Is, are the fossil fuel companies our enemy? Absolutely. If, if they don't buy into what our basic bottom line is, they are the enemy because they're making, they're making their profits on the basis of, of uh, not, not doing what is our sacred responsibility, caring for the air, the water, the soil, and photosynthesis. So this is the challenge we face. So I don't agree with you, Chief Patrick. I don't think that we should say you can make a buck on this. That's not, it is true, of course, you know. There are ways to be more efficient. We're going to save money, certainly among the indigenous communities. Getting off diesel to renewable energy is a huge savings in many of the communities I've been in. But we can't let money be the driving factor. I've been in too many meetings where economics becomes, I mean, look at the argument with Notley and Horgan right now. It all comes down to money that Notley isn't hearing that what Horgan is trying to tell them is, hey, maybe the environment is something we ought to be thinking about. She's not even willing to consider that. And we can't let money be a major factor in the discussion. Sorry, I didn't, yes. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, my name's Jerry. Thanks for the work you're doing. Um, I have a question for Sudhu, uh, a comment and a question. 
Um, I'm an electric vehicle promoter, and I'm an electric vehicle promoter not because of the technology, but because of where it can take us. Uh, the, the challenges of renewable energy, most people will point to the intermittent nature of solar and wind, and electric vehicles fill in the space um, where, where those energy forms um, would let us down. Um, one of the things that a city like Vancouver can do, I'm a little distracted by the sound of my voice coming at me here. Um, one, one of the things that this, a city like Vancouver can do because of its scale and the number of people, the sheer volume of, uh, of vehicles in this city is the, the faster we can get Vancouver to adopt electric vehicles, the faster we can get to technologies like vehicle to grid technology, which balances the grid. Um, contrary to most people's fears that more electric vehicles means a burden on the grid, it's actually the opposite. They're a moving mobile storage reservoir that enables um, owners to become energy traders, not just energy victims. Uh, so it democratizes energy from that point of view. But um, one of the problems I get, I get a lot of pushback from people who live in condos and apartment buildings, and uh, they say, well, I can't charge my car. What am I supposed to do? And what, what a group of us have been pushing other communities to do, um, unlike Vancouver, which can write its own uh, building code, most communities are saddled with uh, a national building code. So we, um, we've been approaching it from the bylaw point of view. We dic bylaws dictate how many parking spaces you can have in a multi-unit uh, residential building. So why not add a few words, I think it amounts to about 10 words, to modify that bylaw to say, and a certain number of them, X, X percentage, have to be hardwired for installation of, uh, at some date, uh, electric vehicle charging stations. Um, you could probably do that in Vancouver and set an example, even if you don't have to, because you can write the bylaws, or you could, sorry, you can write, you can change your uh, building code, um, so I have a question about vehicle to grid and your approach to enabling people who live in multi-unit residential buildings to electrify their transportation. What work is going on in Vancouver that I can take home to Victoria uh, to share with council there? Firstly, um, Doug Smith is up here. Wait, say hello, Doug. This is Doug. He's our sustainability director for the city. So anyone that has any other questions that we don't get in uh, in this formal time should go and talk to Doug afterward. Not me, because he knows way more than I do about this. But to answer your question, um, council a number of years ago actually mandated 20% of parking spaces in condo buildings must be uh, must have the wiring for EVs. And uh, so that we've been doing that. What we found is actually some developers are, are going to 100% because people kind of want this. So we've had no pushback on that. And actually, I'm kind of jumping the gun here, Doug, but um, breaking news, um, we're bringing to council in about a week a recommendation to move to 100% of new, charge, new uh, parking stalls in, in condo buildings and must be EV ready. And that's with the wiring in it and ready to go. So that'll be, that'll be a good move. Um, and um, the challenge that we are having, though, is on the existing stratas, where uh, the building might have been built a number of years ago, and it's not required, the wiring's not there, parking's already allocated to people, you may have somebody that wants it, but their parking doesn't, isn't near the electricity that's needed, and uh, that's, that, that doesn't fall under, really, our jurisdiction, and we've been struggling a little bit with to figure out how to get existing building. We hear a lot of people, I just bought an EV, but I can't park it in my building. Um, so that's something that we're currently working on um, with the province to figure out how to get there um, with the Strata Act. And so that's something that I think is, we could all work toward to, to, to move the dial on. In terms of the technology so that, that they could get it grid interconnected and charge and, and you know use the energy when it's needed out of the battery, it's something that we're in discussions with BC Hydro about. We've got a working group with them on EVs and getting EV ready and and uh, deploying EVs. And so that's uh, we par partner with them pretty closely on this and that's something that we're talking with them about. Thank you. Well, I'm, I've been given the signal that uh, I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap up. Thank you all for, for being here. You can see what a, a, an incredible resource these people are, so I hope you'll be able to uh, 
they'll hang around and maybe uh, you can uh, continue the, uh, the, the conversation. Thank you for joining Charged Up, which I think uh, you get a, an idea. We're in the middle of a fundamental change, and so we can be a big part of that and encourage it and find out what the impediments are, and uh, let's go full on, because uh, this is a challenge of our time, and the solutions are out there. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. To uh, David, Marina, Patrick, and Sadhu. <laughs> Um, I just wonder if you guys want to make your way down and take your seats. Jill Morton has uh, a small token of appreciation. Thank you so much for being here. I just wanted to um, cite a few things that I heard. Let me see if I can actually read my scrawl here. So it, it, it seems like we have the power to look climate change in the eye. Uh, we have the power to raise our energy literacy, to hold mining and resource companies to account. Um, we have the opportunity to see things differently and move towards a more renewable economy and um, a more reciprocal relationship with the earth. So, you know, I really appreciated all the inspiring things that you guys had to say. Steve, we have one last task. I'll ask you to come up and draw the winner for the book prize. This is the book you're going to win. Yeah. <laughs> from Ian Hannington and David Suzuki, just cool it. And the winner is Jessica McGarry. And Jill will have your book down here. Well, I want to thank uh, you all so much for coming. I want to thank our sponsors for this evening, once again, Van City and Energy Geeks. And I really want to make a special thanks to Underlie a number of uh, important supporters who really charged up, charged up, and allowed us uh, to make it to this point. And they are the North Growth Foundation, the Sitka Foundation, the Gencon Foundation, Bullfrog Power, and Bridget Chang. And on our side, you can imagine that an event like this takes a lot of work. So I want to thank uh, Jill Morton, Ashton Orfrain, and Kristen Milliron for all of they, that they did, and for all the staff and volunteers who helped us set up tonight. Uh, we're grateful for, for everything that they've done. We would love to uh, chat some more. We have lots of members from the foundation here and the folks on the, on the panel who are experts in their domain. So hopefully you'll join us uh, in the lobby to continue the discussions. And if you want to learn more and take action, then please visit davidsuzuki.org backslash charged up and let's do this together. Thanks so much, everyone.